This story starts in a shopping mall where Tien, the protagonist, was shopping while listening to the news. In Z City, numerous cases of animal injuries were prompting people to avoid going out at night. Authorities were investigating the issue to prevent panic. Just then, an emergency report came in about a large number of people in X City being infected by an unknown virus. The media continued to report on the situation. Tien picked up canned food, thinking it would be safe as stock food. As he queued to pay, he overheard a conversation between two ladies. One mentioned an elderly man from the Lee family who had been in good health but had recently had a sudden emergency and died on the spot. The second lady asked if it was due to influenza, and the first confirmed it, adding that the old man hadn't even survived for two days. The second lady remarked that many people had recently suffered from the disease. They wondered if the government had identified the cause, as it seemed the world was becoming increasingly unsafe. Tien remembered all the things he had bought and realized he needed to refuel his car with diesel and head straight home to cook for Han with the deer he had hunted earlier in the morning. He started driving, and on the way, he called a girl who asked him about their future together. Tien replied that he would find a job that would allow her to hold her head high among others. As she agreed, Tien made an excuse, saying he couldn't leave Han in an orphanage. The girl became frustrated and pointed out that Han wasn't Tien's blood-related sister, warning him not to talk about marriage if he planned to bring Han along. Tien insisted that Han was his little sister and a crucial part of his family. The girl asked why she should raise such a child as her own without any support, already having suffered enough with Tien. She gave him an ultimatum, if he wasn't going to take her seriously, they should break up. Tien agreed, and she hung up the call. Suddenly, an animal rushed towards his car, splattering blood on the vehicle. Tien stopped and remarked that the animal appeared to be a dog, but upon closer inspection, he realized it was a sheep. The sheep had a head injury and looked frightened. Tien was surprised that it was still alive despite its injury. The sheep then darted into the bushes. Tien decided to forget about the incident and felt it best not to report it to the traffic police. When he arrived home and started unloading his purchases, Han came out with their pets, calling for Tien. He asked her to slow down a bit. She commented on the amount of things he had brought and offered to help him carry them inside. He handed her a small pack of snacks. As they walked, she mentioned that she had completed all the tasks he had given her, such as feeding the livestock, changing the water, and watering the crops. Now she was hungry and looking forward to eating the stew. Tien suggested making a carrot and lentil stew for her, to which she agreed. As they spoke, Tien turned around and saw their white dog eating the crops, so he gently nudged it to stop. As they passed the buffalo, one looked frightened with red eyes. Later, while they were cooking, Han mentioned that she had never seen a solar eclipse before and asked if it was true that the sky would completely darken like evening. They heard on the radio that the highly anticipated total solar eclipse was approaching soon. As Han enjoyed her meal, she complimented Tien on how delicious it was, noting that his cooking skills were improving alongside his hunting abilities. Tien explained to her about the eclipse, advising her to wear the special glasses he had given her to safely observe it. Suddenly, a countdown began from ten. Han pointed outside and asked Tien what was happening. He was stunned to see a dark object obscuring the sun, plunging everything into darkness as if it were night. Han was shocked and started to feel cold. Their black dog began barking nervously, and even the radio signal became disrupted. Han, visibly frightened, urged Tien to look outside. As Tien opened the gate, he was greeted by a sudden blizzard, which seemed unusual in the middle of summer. He quickly told Han to go inside and assured her he would lock up the cattle and sheep. He instructed the dog to stay with Han, who urged him to hurry because of the cold. Tien reassured her and called to the dog to come along. Struggling against the harsh conditions, Tien realized they were in the midst of a blizzard. He asked the dog if he was all right, and as Tien looked up, he was shocked to see the sun shining brightly. He remarked on how strange it was, questioning what could be causing these sudden weather changes. The dog began barking in a particular direction, drawing Tien's attention to a buffalo with red, intimidating eyes. Tien felt a surge of fear at the sight as the cow rushed to attack. The dog darted in to fend off the cow. Tien, evading its charge, hurriedly searched for his compound bow nearby and found it resting on a log. The cow flung the dog aside, prompting Tien to take aim. Though apprehensive, he fired several arrows at its head. Despite hitting their mark, the cow continued its relentless advance towards Tien. 
Shocked by its resilience, Tien sensed something was amiss and knew he needed more time. A warning flashed before him, zero ammunition left with three live targets within range. Disregarding the warning, he readied his bow only to find it empty. The cow knocked him backward. The dog pulled Tien towards the house, barking urgently. Tien glanced back, realizing that if the cow had mutated, perhaps Han wasn't safe inside either. Inside, the dog's eyes turned red as he growled at Han. Han wondered what was wrong with the dog. The dog lunged at her, but Tien intervened just in time, kicking the dog away. He lifted Han and assured her he would take her to a safe place, urging her to hide indoors where it was safer. Tien explained that the dog was now dangerous, emphasizing that she must trust him and stay inside as he escorted her out. Tien checked the screen again and confirmed that the number of living beings had increased to four. After securing Han in the safe house and instructing her not to leave, Tien hurriedly locked the door as the number of living bodies increased. B attacked Tien from behind, but Tien managed to lock Han inside before turning to face B. Hei rushed to Tien's aid, earning praise from him. Tien instructed Hei to hold B off while he dealt with the cow that was still pursuing him. Grabbing an axe, Tien positioned himself near a tree. The cow charged, but Tien dodged, causing its horn to impale the tree and trap it in place. As Tien moved to attack the cow, B suddenly lunged and bit into Tien's neck. Tien wondered if Hei had been killed. Blood dripped from Tien's mouth as he struggled to stop B's attack. Then he heard a strange sound. He saw numerous screens swirling around him and wondered what they were. The noise was overwhelming, but Tien focused on dealing with the two beasts to ensure Han's safety. Amidst the chaos, he noticed one screen displaying the message, Apocalypse Survival Game Match Success. As the apocalyptic game loaded successfully, Tien became its player, finding himself in a poorly maintained manner at level 1. He received the Eye of Truth as a reward, and his class was B. To upgrade to a fortress, he needed 800,000 points. Lying on the ground, he woke, wondering if he was still alive. His torn clothes and bloodstains remained, but he was shocked to see that his wounds had vanished. Puzzled, he wondered where the cow and bee were. A strange sensation overcame him, and he realized that both the cow and bee lay dead nearby. He questioned what had happened during his unconsciousness, knowing such damage couldn't be caused by a human. He felt a change within him. Welcomed into the apocalypse survival game, as his status activated, a surge of power washed over him. Feeling as if a beam of light had struck him, igniting a rage within, he saw the cow still alive. Tien leapt at it with his axe. He pushed aside thoughts of his recent experiences, pondering his newfound abilities, including wound healing and the strange explosion he had witnessed. As Tien processed the situation, it became increasingly clear that this was more than just a game. The system had fully loaded, and his shelter had been successfully established. Points had been allocated, beginner rewards distributed, and players were urged to assess themselves. Tien wondered if this flood of information was directly implanted into his mind. He learned that the first phase of destruction had concluded, with the second phase scheduled to begin in 30 days. Natural disasters loomed, and the shelter stood as the last bastion of safety. Tien felt the weight of responsibility to not only survive, but also to fortify his shelter into the strongest fortress possible. The first phase had already poisoned the land humans relied upon for survival, leaving him anxious about what the second phase would bring. Examining B, Tien realized he had passed out. According to the information he gleaned, B and the others must have mutated after consuming radiation-contaminated plants. After securing B in a makeshift cage to prevent any harm, Tien tied him up tightly and turned his attention to checking on Han. Entering the safe house, he descended the stairs in darkness. Trying to switch on the lights, he discovered they hadn't been restored. His phone showed no signal, suggesting the communication system was also down but the backup diesel generator provided some relief. Using the faint glow of a flashlight, Tien searched the room, wondering where Han was and why there was no movement. Spotting Han's legs, he hurried over and found her lying down. His system indicated that Han was sleeping peacefully. She woke at the sound of his approach and asked why he hadn't spread out the mattress instead of sleeping on the floor. She explained she had obediently waited for him, recalling a bright light and nothing more, before asking if he was all right. He reassured her that everything was under control and there was no need to worry. Han inquired about B's whereabouts, 
to which Tian explained that B was injured and unavailable for the time being. He suggested she rest a while longer while he attended to matters. Han agreed and drifted back to sleep. As she slept, Tian pondered the absence of mutant domestic animals and wondered how this system differed from online games. Upon further investigation, he discovered a starting bonus that seemed somewhat familiar. However, it was disappointing, as he had hoped for weapons or skills, but instead found that he needed another 999 points to start the game. Staring at the screen, he noticed a question mark in one corner and wondered about its significance. It appeared that the primary currency of this system was points, and he recalled the seed he had planted in the poisoned land. Realizing its high cost, he knew he couldn't afford it at the moment. He resolved to check the stockpile of supplies at home, knowing that those in direct contact with the ground had already been contaminated in various ways. As the network disconnected, Tian realized it might take some time to recover, and he doubted the situation outside was promising. Contemplating the polluted sources around him, he knew he had to address them soon. Looking outside, he opened a door in the safe house and found an array of guns neatly arranged. Starting the diesel generator, Tian loaded a pistol and placed a walkie-talkie near Han before leaving. Driving his car at high speed, he inadvertently attracted numerous mutated animals toward him and resolved to deal with them quickly. Suddenly, a military truck approached from behind, overtaking Tian and blocking his path. The truck's machine gun targeted Tian's car, threatening to open fire. As an army scout with a zoom scope overlooked Tian, he observed that the normally bustling Vitoki road surface was raised. Tian suspected military forces were stationed nearby and sensed a crisis in the city. He wondered about Zhang King's whereabouts. The soldier warned Tian of the danger outside and advised him to return home through Vitoki. Someone reported that Area B was under attack by mutant cats and urgently needed reinforcements. Tian explained to the soldier that he had left home due to lack of supplies and asked about the current city situation. The soldier directed him to the designated government supply point and emphasized the city's unsafe conditions, urging Tian to return home promptly. Tian agreed, and the soldier departed as a military aircraft flew overhead. Tian contemplated the presence of mutant creatures. Despite his recent split with Zhang Lin, he couldn't ignore the post-apocalyptic world and resolved to check on her during his journey. As he entered the city, Tian encountered widespread destruction. People spoke of another looting incident on XX Street, and a female body had been discovered at Pond Number XX. Driving through, Tian noticed that only police cars and ambulances remained active. He witnessed two men hurriedly loading an injured woman into an ambulance. She was on the brink of shock from severe blood loss. Another paramedic mentioned a case of lung damage due to food poisoning, urging readiness to administer an adrenaline shot. They discussed the shortage of cardiac stimulants due to high patient volumes, with many infected by the same illness. Nearby, a distraught woman begged her infected husband not to fall asleep. They were almost at the hospital. He lamented the lack of available beds and the overwhelmed emergency hotline. Tian concluded that the healthcare system was struggling to cope, exacerbated by the effects of radiation leaks from nearby plants. Tian wondered if he could manage to get his hands on enough supplies to survive the game successfully. The police were instructing citizens that the location was a government-designated emergency supply procurement site. They emphasized the need for everyone to follow the rules, form orderly queues, and avoid rushing. Each person had a purchase limit. Five genes of rice, five genes of flour, and one gene of vegetables, verified with a valid ID. Arguments erupted as people fought over their place in line. One person insisted they had been waiting for five hours and deserved to be served first, while another claimed the spot was originally theirs before a restroom break. Tensions escalated, especially when someone purported to be the general manager of a local corporation, leading to confrontations with others in line. Some were even forcibly removed. Meanwhile, on the fringes, a young girl cried to her mother for food. Tian witnessed two people fighting over a scarce resource, each claiming they had reached it first, while a frantic rush for supplies continued among the crowd. As Tian contemplated his girlfriend's rented apartment just around the corner, a speeding car narrowly missed him as he was about to turn. The car screeched to a halt, and a man emerged, knocking on Tian's window to inquire if he had come from the procurement site and what he was looking for. He had noticed Tian wandering around the department store market. The man tried to offer various fruits and vegetables, watermelon, cucumber, pumpkin, tomatoes, but Tian challenged him, saying he would only buy if the man dared to take a bite first. The man hesitated, 
asking why Tien didn't trust him and insisting that he hadn't seen anything to buy himself. Tien, frustrated, told him to leave. The man questioned why Tien was being confrontational, asserting he was a law-abiding citizen. Tien then showed a gun, causing the man to recoil in fear, urging Tien to talk things out and emphasizing his compliance with the law. Tien sternly warned the man that if he caught him conducting such heartless business again, he wouldn't hesitate to shoot him with no repercussions. The man agreed nervously, retrieving his things and reflecting on the tough spot he found himself in. He quickly got into his car and left. Tien proceeded to his girlfriend's apartment building. Climbing the stairs, he arrived at Zhang's door and knocked, calling out to her. With no answer, he began to worry if she was even home. Retrieving the spare key from under the doormat, he unlocked the door and entered. Inside, Tien was shocked to find the typically neat room in disarray. Contaminated fruits and medicine boxes were scattered around. Among them, he recognized Tian Run's antibiotics, a product known for its terrible reputation from a local pharmaceutical company. He wondered why Zhang had bought such things. Noticing no signs of blood or accidental poisoning, Tian realized the place had been ransacked, but not in Zhang's usual meticulous manner. There were no signs of forced entry either, everything seemed deliberately disturbed in the chaotic world outside. Tian pondered where she could possibly have gone. The scene shifts to the outskirts of the city, where a poorly managed manor serves as a makeshift guesthouse. It is rated at level 1 shelter grade, offering basic amenities. The level 1 shelter skill reward is the Eye of Truth, allowing the host to see detailed information about objects and creatures. Additionally, the privileges include a remote control shelter system that provides real-time updates on shelter status and inventory, accessible even when the player is away. The area spans 30 mu, suitable for fishing, animal husbandry, planting, and construction. Reflecting on his situation, Tien realizes he's currently at a loss. He resides in a dilapidated level 1 greenhouse and resolves to earn enough points to upgrade farm equipment without neglecting anti-radiation measures. As he toils in the fields, Han arrives and excitedly announces that the seeds have sprouted. Tien, Han, and Hei gather to witness the successful growth, bringing joy to Han. Tien observes on the screens that the tomato seeds had been successfully planted and would mature in 48 hours. He is pleased with the progress, noting that the anti-radiation grade seeds are performing as expected, maturing quickly. With more points, he and Han could certainly survive in the post-apocalyptic world. Han expresses her initial doubts about the seeds, thinking they had all withered, but she credits Tien for their success. Tien confidently remarks that he always finds a way, reminding Han of the rules he had set for her to follow. She affirms her understanding and vows not to be underestimated. Han reiterates the rules, only consume food approved by Tien, not leave the farm without permission, report any unusual animals, and keep an eye on Hei to prevent him from eating indiscriminately. Tien instructs Hei to listen as well. Recognizing that the anti-radiation crops are ripe, Tien resolves to harvest them promptly. He discovers that the harvest is bountiful, especially with the radiation-resistant tomatoes proving to be nutritious. Long-term consumption promises to enhance overall health with a storage life of 30 days. Tien ponders whether they could also improve physical fitness and eagerly tastes one. Instantly, he feels a comforting warmth spread throughout his body, alleviating the fatigue from days of hard work. In this food-scarce post-apocalyptic world, the upgraded crops not only provide sustenance but also seem to offer attribute bonuses. Tien muses over the idea of becoming a full-fledged farm owner within the system. Unlocking permissions, purchasing from the mall, and upgrading shelters all rely on accumulating points, which are obtained primarily through the exchange system. This system facilitates the recycling of crops, livestock, meat, and minerals, each graded differently and priced accordingly. The supreme god-tier crops are exchanged for the highest points. These top-tier crops are powerful and fetch significant points. Ancient medical-grade specialized crops are known for their medicinal properties. Anti-radiation-grade crops are specifically designed to thrive in radiation-affected environments. Tien realizes that mastering this exchange system will be crucial for their survival and growth in the harsh new world they find themselves in. He learns about the point system for different grades of crops. Level 1 anti-radiation-grade crops yield 1 kilo for 1 point. Level 2 ancient medical-grade crops yield 1 kilo for 100 points. Level 3 God-tier powerful crops yield 1 kilo for 1,000 points, 
and level 4 Supreme God tier enhanced crops yield 1 kilo for 100,000 points. This exchange system provides a comprehensive service from supply and sales to recycling, making it a vital tool for transforming the farm into a top-tier military base if enough points are accumulated. TN eagerly anticipates this transformation. Reflecting on the anti-radiation grade crops, TN considers the potential of the three higher grades, each promising even more significant effects. Excited, he decides to inspect the harvest of the ancient medicinal grade crops. Observing the carrots, he confirms their 10% maturity rate, as expected for ancient medicinal grade crops. Further investigation reveals that these carrots are at 100% maturity. They are capable of clearing all negative effects such as poison, illness, and irreversible damage caused by negative effects. Remarkably, they can be stored indefinitely. TN recognizes the immense potential these crops hold for their survival and future endeavors in the challenging world they now navigate. TN marvels at the newfound security of having the ancient medicinal grade crops, knowing they no longer need to worry about medical treatment. Turning his attention to the recycling interface, he decides to sell 70% of the harvested crops for points and keep the remaining 30% as reserves in his backpack. Confirming the recycling of 200 kilos of radiation-resistant crops, TN receives 2,000 points and finds that three ancient medicinal grade crops are stored in the warehouse. Pleased with the outcome, he now has 30 genes of anti-radiation grade crops safely stored. To his surprise, TN is congratulated for completing his first recycling task and achieves the title of Master of Recycling, earning a reward, a smart working robot of the agricultural type. As the robot appears in his palm and waves, TN can't help but feel skeptical about its usefulness given its small size. He wonders about the achievement system, suspecting it might lead to more rewards and useful items. Yet, he can't shake the feeling that the robot is staring at him in an oddly unsettling way. As the robot swiftly begins cutting the crops, TN is astonished, wondering how it seems to anticipate his thoughts. Could it be that his consciousness is somehow linked to the system, enabling direct commands to the robot from his mind? He marvels at its capabilities, realizing even a farming robot could be so advanced. Thoughts of earning enough points to exchange for a combat robot cross his mind, considering how it could ensure Han's safety conveniently. Excited by their successful crop germination, TN felt a sense of hope amidst the chaos. TN called Han for a meal, asking her to stop watching cartoons. They enjoyed big chicken legs together that day, celebrating their agricultural success. Han, though happy, reminded TN of their need to be more frugal with food. Their companion eagerly joined in the meal. TN assured Han they could resume planting and use some of their stored food. He then warned her that if anyone discovered their food supplies, she would be forbidden from eating for three days. Han agreed, promising to keep their provisions secret. TN suggested they eat, knowing Han must be tired of instant noodles after two days. He gave the first chicken leg to Hei, thanking him for protecting both TN and Han. Han affectionately hugged Hei, calling him the best before letting him go and wondering how B was feeling. TN reassured her that B was still recovering from serious injuries and wouldn't be able to see her for a while, but promised they would play together once he was better. Han agreed and promised not to disturb B in the attic. Suddenly, TN noticed a warning indicating someone was attempting to invade. He quickly accessed the monitoring screen and discovered the intruder was an unarmed 42-year-old male with a threat level of 3. To his surprise, he realized it was Uncle Nan. TN wondered how Nan had ended up there under these circumstances. TN stepped outside and approached Nan, questioning why he had come. Nan, smoking a cigarette, exhaled slowly before acknowledging TN as boss. He explained his dire situation, requesting help and inquiring if TN's farm had any surplus food. Nan had no other options. His home had been ransacked, his stored food stolen, and market prices were exorbitant due to shortages. TN apologized, revealing that his own food stores had been depleted, worsened by a recent crop failure due to mutation. Despite this, TN offered what little rations he could spare, expressing gratitude to Nan for looking after his family. Nan, crestfallen, admitted he had already approached many relatives, all unable to assist him. TN then handed Nan a pack of cup noodles, urging him to explore other options first. Nan thanked him profusely, to which TN wished him luck. Nan, resigned to their unfortunate circumstances, departed. TN estimated that the food would last Nan about five days. In uncertain times like these, human intentions were unpredictable, 
prompting Tien to stay cautious. He decided to check on Nan that night, realizing he didn't need the common vegetables stored in the freezer. At nightfall, Tien, accompanied by Han, quietly approached Nan's house, each bringing their own snacks. Suddenly, they heard Xiao scream. Nan hushed Tien, warning him not to startle Xiao. Xiao continued coughing up blood, his condition worsening by the moment. Emotionally distraught, Nan questioned why Zhao's condition was deteriorating instead of improving. As Xiao continued to cough up blood, Tian and Han peered through the window. Han, visibly frightened by the sight, was reassured by Tian that everything would be fine, urging her not to look. Reflecting on Zhao's symptoms, Tian suspected Xiao had accidentally consumed irradiated vegetables, explaining the rapid deterioration. However, Tian questioned if Xiao, being the best candidate for experimentation, would survive this ordeal. Ultimately, Zhao's fate would hinge on luck. The window glass shattered as a pouch flew into Nan's house, startling both him and Xiao. Nan grew furious, demanding to know who threw it. Xiao urged caution and suggested they inspect the package. Reluctantly, Nan agreed, instructing Xiao to stay put while he investigated. Upon opening the pouch, Nan was shocked to find fresh vegetables and food inside. Overcome with emotion, Xiao expressed his desire to survive, willing to try anything even if it meant lying about his condition. Nan broke down, admitting even the hospital couldn't help Xiao, but he couldn't bear to watch him suffer without trying. Determined, Nan convinced Xiao to eat the food, urging him to chew carefully. Xiao screamed and coughed violently for a moment before suddenly stopping. Nan rejoiced at Xiao's apparent improvement. Meanwhile, Tian noticed a streetlight flickering back to life, indicating the return of electricity and potentially phone signal. He immediately called his girlfriend Zhang, but she didn't answer despite the phone ringing. The scene shifted to a moving car where several men sat, one of their phones ringing. They pondered whose phone it was until the owner recognized it as Zhang's, suggesting they turn it off now that the signal was restored. One of them inquired about their food stash, relieved they had enough for a month. Pleased with their decision to follow their leader, they discussed their motives. The largest man silenced their questioning, emphasizing the importance of money and action. They all agreed. After the incident at Nan's house, Tian and Han hurried away in their car. Han remarked on the miraculous change she witnessed in Xiao, how he had been vomiting blood before eating the carrot but soon recovered, his pallor shifting from gray to blue. Tian noted Han's vivid descriptions, reminiscent of her love for animations. Suddenly, an animal attacked their car from above. Tian spotted it, a monkey with menacing claws peering through the window. He instructed Han to stay calm and hold tight. She nodded fearfully, complying with his request. Tian maneuvered the car in a serpentine motion, attempting to dislodge the monkey. He then instructed Han to duck her head, which she did obediently. Despite their efforts, the monkey persisted and ended up in front of the car. Thinking quickly, Tian swerved the vehicle, causing the monkey to collide with a rock. Drawing his gun, Tian shot the monkey, ensuring it posed no further threat. Exiting the car to inspect, Tian discovered a pool of blood where the monkey had fallen. Amongst the blood, he found a coded message. Perplexed, he wondered where it could have come from, as there were no nearby breeding farms or zoos. Tian's thoughts returned to the dire state of the city. As he drove home, he instructed Han to relax and watch her animation, explaining that he had some matters to attend to. Agreeing, she departed, leaving Tian to confront B, still in his altered state. Donning gloves, Tian contemplated whether the ancient medicinal carrot could reverse the effects of radiation on B and restore his consciousness. Tentatively, he fed the carrot to B, hoping for a positive outcome. B growled loudly in response. Meanwhile, Han, engrossed in her cartoon, heard unsettling noises and grew concerned about Tian's prolonged absence. Rushing to find him, she entered the room where Tian and B were. Wanting to play a prank, she tapped Tian on the back, startling him. Relieved to see her, Tian asked if it was her. Han confirmed and teased him about being scared. However, their attention soon turned to B, lying motionless with blood around him. Han was overcome with emotion, collapsing in despair. Tian urged her to compose herself as she sobbed, questioning why they couldn't save B with the carrots that had saved Xiao. Tian sadly explained that the carrots couldn't reverse mutations like B's. Han continued crying, expressing her deep sorrow at the prospect of B dying. The next day, 
they performed the final rites for B and bid him a solemn farewell. Han remained silent throughout. Tian gently took her hand, suggesting they return indoors as it was growing late. Despite her absorbed state in the cartoon, Tian interrupted to invite her for dinner, preparing her favorite dish. Han didn't respond verbally but indicated she wanted him to stay with her in the house, to which Tian agreed. Later, Tian sat outside and noticed a screen announcement about radiation-resistant crops nearing maturity, prompting him to prepare for their harvest. Soon, they harvested approximately 500 kilos of radiation-resistant crops and 10 kilos of ancient medicinal-grade crops. A small robot returned to Tien, confirming successful points redemption. As a result, his level 1 dilapidated greenhouse upgraded to a level 2 ordinary house. However, Tien received a warning that his defense shelter was only rated level 3, capable of repelling small wild animals but risky against larger threats. It strongly advised establishing a defense system promptly. Tien considered his top priority to ensure the safety of the farm. With current crop levels yielding high power, he decided to postpone expanding production, upgrading the wall reinforcements from level 1 to 2, and successfully purchasing the perimeter power grid, elevating his security readiness to level 1. Aware of the remaining points, he prioritized acquiring mechanical guards for Han's safety. He spotted a guard priced at 3,500 points and calculated that selling the grain stored in the warehouse would nearly cover the cost. Confident in his ability to earn more points if needed, Tian proceeded with the purchase of a level 1 hummingbird and a level 2 hound. Observing the hummingbird in action, Tian marveled at its precision as it efficiently dispatched fallen leaves with bullets. With the air patrol spinner now available, Tian decided it was time to test the ground combat capabilities, directing the hound to demolish a rock. The hound utilized its beam attack to effortlessly demolish the rock, leaving Tian visibly relieved by the successful demonstration. He then brought Han over to meet the hound, explaining that it would accompany her and provide protection. Tian suggested naming it B, which deeply moved Han. Meanwhile, in a city building, a man reported to Ling that they had successfully cleared up the out-of-control samples, with only the data from number 7 steadily increasing. He noted that it could now penetrate NM-thick steel plates effortlessly. Ling inquired about the situation on the other side. The man replied that Ren was displeased with their failure to procure medical equipment donations, which could complicate matters if reported to the head office. Seated calmly, Ling dismissed Ren's concerns, referring to her as just a girl with limited influence. He assured the man that their activities were conducted discreetly, making it difficult for Ren to launch a successful investigation without knowing where to start. The man agreed, mentioning that the head office remained unaware of their operations. Ling instructed him to keep a close watch on Ren to prevent her from disrupting their business. With that, Ling left the room, contemplating the potential for a significant treasure awaiting discovery. The scene shifts to Ren, who was walking angrily, asking where Ling was. The lady apologized and said that Ling wasn't in the company at that time. Ren was making things very difficult for them, so he should wait. Just as Ren opened a door and asked Ling what was going on in his head, he mentioned that now the entire southern region's medical system was paralyzed. As a medical company, Ling should lead his staff to actively cooperate with the hospital, donate equipment and medicines, instead of being busy with animal experiments. Ling replied that it was the general manager's office and it wasn't appropriate for her to barge in like that. He was a businessman, and his purpose was to profit from everything. He didn't believe that Day's medical treatments could do anything for that worldwide disease. Ren asked what disease it was. Ling replied that she was also a shareholder in the company and enjoyed dividends. Could she imagine how rewarding it would be if they could develop a solution? Ren asked if Ling's research had made any progress, noting that even the Yen Wan federal government hadn't developed any effective drugs yet. She mentioned that she would have to visit his lab. Ling replied that he was kidding, emphasizing that such developments couldn't happen so quickly. He suggested that if she could cooperate more and invest more manpower in the project, progress would be faster. Ren said that she would go to the lab later to check on the progress and ensure she could cooperate effectively with the project. Ling assured her she was welcome and had arranged personal escorts. Ren agreed to go. Ling saw her out. As Ren walked, a boy escorted her and mentioned that the technical team had found her time in the office too short to conduct a thorough scan, and accessing the secret laboratory entrance was likely not feasible at the moment. Ren commented that it was an old issue and asked if the boy had obtained a statement from the captured scientist. The boy denied this, 
explaining that they were blindfolded each time they entered and exited, but they did have key cards. Ren expressed her appreciation for the information, then she gave a card and wondered where else that could be other than those places and if the most dangerous place could also be the safest. She entered the laboratory and a man introduced himself as Tuzi, in charge of accompanying and explaining everything to Ren. He offered to show her around and Ren agreed, saying, let's go and check on the progress of the experimental subjects first. Tuzi led her to see Subject 7, the only one in the experimental batch that hadn't gone berserk. Its power had increased tenfold, though it remained unstable and showed signs of aggressiveness, though not as brainlessly bloodthirsty as the failures. Suddenly, another man approached Tuzi with bad news and whispered in his ear. Tuzi was visibly shocked. The man explained they didn't know what had happened and asked Tuzi to come and check. Tuzi asked how this could have occurred. Tuzi then apologized to Ren, explaining there was an emergency and he couldn't continue to accompany her. He assured her that a colleague would take over. Ren replied that it was fine, as it was just a routine check and she would walk around for a while before leaving. The man expressed fear, stating that their actions were against the rules. Ren confidently replied, We are all under surveillance coverage, so what is there to worry about? Just hurry and don't delay, it seems important. Tuzi agreed and assured her they would ensure her safety at all times before they departed. Ren, on a call with a boy through earbuds, told him it was time to act. The boy, seated in a room with his laptop, confirmed that the surveillance was covered. Ren instructed him to scan the place for their hideout. The boy asked her to check the northeast corner for a hollow in the wall or something that could be pressed. She found it and pressed it. The boy informed her she had 30 minutes. Agreeing, Ren entered through the open door and discovered numerous human bodies in jars. The boy asked for her assessment. She replied grimly, It's worse than we predicted. The boy asked if he should contact the head officer to intervene. She declined, asking him to wait as she examined further. She saw a mermaid and asked if Ren recognized the name, revealing it was Zhang, Tien's girlfriend. The scene shifts to Tien, who found that his radiation-resistant grade corn was ripe for picking. Han was delighted to see it. Tien asked her to come and help him finish the work early for dinner. She eagerly agreed, taking one and expressing her desire to eat grilled corn later. Tien asked if she was already hungry. She replied that she was too hungry to just pick corn. He instructed her to gather some dry wood while he prepared grilled corn with butter. She was thrilled to hear that. While cooking, Han sat nearby and jokingly asked what would happen if she kept eating like that and turned into a fat pig. Tien thought that her appetite had exceeded his own recently. He explained that the special crop could enhance their physical fitness, and as her physique developed, her nutritional needs would increase. Since she was still growing, eating more wouldn't cause her to gain weight. She agreed and began eating the corn. Tien watched her profile and thought that after eating the radiation-resistant vegetables for a few days, both his and Han's physical conditions had improved significantly. He joked that even if she kept eating like that, she wouldn't turn into King Kong Barbie, imagining how she might look and laughing at the thought. Han commented that the grilled corn was delicious. Tien promised to make her a spicy one next. He considered that with their shelter, even if Han's appetite grew comparable to Luffy's in the future, they could still afford it. Hearing a visitor, he wondered who would be visiting at such a time. Checking, he found it was Xia with a bag. Tien wondered if it was the food he had given Xia and what he was doing there. Tien approached Xia and asked what brought him there. Xia explained that Tien had given his family some instant noodles the other day, and his father insisted on returning the favor by sending some food to Tien's family, which Xia had brought over. Tien reassured him it was fine, thinking he had helped the right person. Curious, Tien asked Xia where he had found all the food. Xia admitted he had found it in his yard, speculating it might have been quietly sent by a relative or someone who snuck it in. Xia wanted to repay Tien's kindness and also had something to ask him. Tien encouraged Xia to ask his question. Xia mentioned he had heard about a new grain shopping center opening on the outskirts of the southern side that still had a lot of stock. He wanted to borrow Tien's truck to go and buy some. Tien agreed, and Xia added that he didn't have a driver's license. The shopping center was in a remote location, not too far away. Tien understood that Xia was asking him to accompany him there. Xia assured Tien that it wouldn't take long, making a request. 
Tien thought about how he had been stuck on the farm recently and had planned to visit the shopping center in a couple of days to check on things. Since the opportunity came early, he decided to go with Xia. With the mechanical guards at home, he felt relieved about Han's security. Besides, B's combat abilities could handle even a small group if needed. Tien agreed, mentioning they were old acquaintances, but he needed to be back before noon to cook for Han. Xia apologized for causing trouble. Tien asked him to wait there while he went to get the truck. Inside, Tien instructed Han to stay home and not open the door for anyone. She reassured him not to worry and praised B's capabilities. Tien asked how B had become so capable. She explained it was an upgraded version and demonstrated how it easily smashed through big rocks with a bam-bam. Tien asked if that was so and reminded Han that she could only use B in emergencies in the future, as it could be dangerous otherwise. She agreed, saying she wouldn't blow up rocks anymore. Tien affectionately ruffled her hair, promising that he and Xia would go shopping and bring back candy for her. Curious, she asked if Xia was there and expressed a desire to greet him. Tien playfully pinched her cheek and asked if she wanted to show off B to others. She insisted she was six years old now and not a child anymore, feeling suffocated that no one except Tien talked to her that way. Tien agreed and took Han with him to the truck outside. Han greeted Xia and tried to tell him about B, but Tien stopped her, telling her to get out of the car and let Xia sit there so they could leave early and return in time for him to cook for her. As they left, Han complained that Tien was being mean and hadn't let her finish greeting Xia. She hurried inside to forget about it and watch cartoons. While traveling, Tien thought that Han could be naive sometimes, expecting she would say something like that. After a while, Xia asked Tien if it was okay for Han to be home alone. He expressed concern about the current chaotic world and feared the farm might be targeted by bad guys, putting her in danger. Tien scoffed, questioning who would bother with his shabby farm that had no money or food. He reminded Xia that Han was only six years old. Even if she had a self-defense weapon, she wouldn't be able to use it. He thought there was no safer place for her than the farm right now. Xia asked if Tien had any self-defense tools for Han. Tien replied that he had electrified the farm gate, so no one could break in, reassuring Xia not to worry about it. Xia expressed relief and then took out his phone to text someone. Tien noticed, and Xia quickly put his phone back in his pocket, explaining he was worried he didn't have enough money and had borrowed some from friends. The scene shifted to Han, who was watching cartoons excitedly. She exclaimed that they should use the Rainbow Warriors, suggesting Lemon Yellow Super Evolution, Golden Yellow, and noted Xia could change his color too. She hugged her toy, Hey, and asked if Xia could be a member of the Rainbow Warriors. Hey looked confused. Han joked that last time she and Tien had seen Xia, he was green with greed, but now he was red, which she found funny. Tien gave some money to Xia, who was confused to see that. Tien explained that he didn't have much money either, so Xia could take it for now. Xia declined, insisting that Tien had already helped his family a lot and he couldn't accept any money. Tien insisted, telling Xia to stop talking nonsense and focus on driving. Xia acted grateful for Tien's help and promised to repay his kindness. As they drove, Tien realized they needed to go straight for 500 meters, then turn right 300 meters ahead. Another 200 meters ahead, they would reach a fork in the road, and 100 meters beyond that, they needed to turn right. Xia seemed worried. Just as Tien was about to turn right, Xia moved the steering wheel to the left, claiming the road to the right was closed and they should go left instead. Tien felt something was off and shouted that it wasn't true, as he often traveled that road. It was the main road in the township and couldn't be closed without a major natural disaster. He asked Xia where he had heard that news. Xia replied that his friend had told him. Tien asked for his friend's contact and insisted on hearing it from him directly. Xia urged Tien to trust him and turn before it was too late, promising he wouldn't harm Tien. Reluctantly, Tien began turning his car around. Meanwhile, bystanders noticed the situation, and one man commented that something seemed wrong. He contacted others in a nearby car, wondering how Tien could decide to turn back alone. Another person asked what they should do. Nan replied that he was ready and their target was approaching, so they had to stop them. Ling added that they needed to capture them alive, block their escape routes, and attack from both the front and rear. He sarcastically remarked about seeing if they could grow wings and fly away that day before asking for updates. Xiao then apologized to Tien, 
admitting that he had betrayed him and it was all his fault. He tearfully explained that there was nothing he could do as some people had taken his father away. Tien asked him to calm down and explain who those people were and what they wanted. Crying, Xiao told Tien that they were from Tan Run and knew Tien had the antidote for the poisoning. They had coerced Xiao into luring Tien away from the farm so they could capture Han and force Tien to submit. Tien exclaimed that Han was only six years old and they intended to kidnap a child. Xiao replied that he didn't know and that they had threatened his father's life, leaving him with no other choice. Just then, a car blocked their way. Xiao told Tien that those people had arrived. Tien shouted at Xiao to be quiet, saying everything Xiao had done was just to test him and find out if the farm was protected. When Xiao was playing with his phone, he was actually messaging the other party. Soon, some people with machines appeared in front of Tien's house. Xiao apologized to Tien, urging him to give them the antidote, as there were too many of them and they wouldn't be able to escape. Tien replied that he was furious with Xiao and didn't want to kill him, but he couldn't believe Xiao had endangered Han. Crying, Xiao apologized again, saying he regretted it but they had taken his father and there was no turning back. He pleaded with Tien to give them the antidote. Tien told Xiao he would deal with him later, and unfortunately for the intruders, none of them would leave his farm alive. Tien remembered the night when he was healed and how Nan was so happy about it, saying how scared he had been. Xiao admitted that he couldn't believe he had actually survived. Nan commented that Xiao was an idiot for eating something different that caused his illness. Xiao explained that he was so hungry he couldn't stand it anymore and found an apple in the cellar that didn't seem to have any trace of contamination. Nan scolded Xiao for being so desperate and daring to eat anything from the cellar, as they were all in contact with the ground. Xiao replied that they had been eating nothing but gruel for several days, so he decided to take a gamble. Otherwise, he would have starved to death sooner or later. Nan told him to stop talking nonsense and mentioned that he had borrowed some food and they had received a wave of food drops. Among them was a magical elixir that saved Zhao's life, which must have been a blessing from the gods. They couldn't bear to see Xiao suffer so much, so they saved his life. Nan reminded Xiao that many people had died from accidentally eating poisonous vegetables and he was the only one who survived. Therefore, they must go pay homage to their ancestral graves later to thank them for their blessings. Xiao thought that if there really was a god, such a disaster shouldn't be allowed to happen in this world. He believed the elixir had been given by someone who didn't want to reveal their identity. Then, he noticed a bag of fruits and heard Nan ask if he was hungry. Xiao couldn't believe someone had given them so much food while their family had been left to starve without even the basic necessities for survival. Nan assured him that they had received all this food and that he was going to get something for Xiao to eat, emphasizing that Xiao was still recovering from a serious illness and needed to recover well. Suddenly, Xiao remembered something and got up to go outside. Nan asked where he was going. Xiao replied that he would be back in a while. Nan insisted that Xiao wasn't fully recovered and needed to rest. Xiao asked to be left alone and then went to someone's home and knocked on the door. The boy inside replied, telling him to stop knocking rapidly and demanding to know who was there. When Miao opened the door, he was shocked to see Xiao covered in blood. Miao asked what Xiao wanted. Xiao replied that his home had been robbed and he just wanted to check the surveillance video. Miao asked what that was. Xiao showed him the camera and said it was a 360 degrees unplugged wireless monitor. Miao agreed. Xiao asked to check who had beaten him up because he needed to find them. Miao agreed but told him to hurry because it was his sleep time. As Xiao went to check, he thought the camera happened to have the perfect angle for his alleyway and wondered who the person would be. Then he saw a truck and recognized its owner by the license plate. He then returned home. Nan asked what he had been doing. Xiao replied that he had found out who saved his life. Nan asked who it was. Xiao said it was Tian. He had checked the CCTV and found that Tien's arrival and departure times matched the time of Zhao's rescue. Nan said that Tien was a good person who not only gave them food but also saved Zhao's life. Xiao then asked Nan if he had heard the news that the Tan Run group was paying a good amount of money to those who could find a solution. Nan was shocked and asked what Xiao was thinking of doing. Xiao replied that he was trying to make life a bit easier for both of them in this hellish world. He questioned how long their current food supply would last and what they would do afterward, asking if Nan still expected Tien to give them more food. Nan slapped Xiao and asked if he wanted to repay Tien with such hatred. 
He exclaimed how he could have given birth to such an ungrateful beast and threatened to break Zhao's legs if he dared to go to Tan Run. Xiao asked if Nand understood their current situation, saying they could only rely on themselves to survive. He insisted he was doing what he had to do to survive, and that was all. As he was thinking about how they couldn't get rid of their pursuers because they were following too closely, he saw two cars blocking his way. Just then, he found himself surrounded from all sides. He came out holding Xiao tightly in his grasp. Chen called Tian, introducing himself as an affiliate of Tan Run Pharmaceutical Company. He explained that he was using a special method to get Tian to meet him and assured Tian that he had no ulterior motives. Chen mentioned that they knew Tian had the cure for the poisoning pandemic and proposed discussing cooperation. Tian would provide the cure and they would contribute their efforts, making huge profits together. Tian asked what would happen if he refused. Chen replied that Tian had only two options. The first was to cooperate, making everyone happy and allowing them all to earn money with smiles on their faces. Tian then asked about the second option. Chen responded that they would find a cure for the disease themselves, implying they would use force if necessary. Tian replied that it was only by chance he had discovered the cure for the poisoning epidemic and there was only one dose, which he had already used. Chen introduced himself as an affiliate of Tan Run Pharmaceutical Company, explaining he had come to discuss cooperation regarding Tian's cure for the poisoning pandemic. Tian regretted that they had come all this way for nothing, noting they didn't even have guns and that Xiao was of no use to them. If they had firearms, they could have simply injured Tian without the need for threats. Chen remarked that Tian seemed unmoved even in the face of danger. Chen made a call and asked if they were at the farm gate, instructing them to capture the little girl and feed her the poisonous fruits. He questioned the point of electrifying Tian's broken fence, knowing it was surrounded by insulation protection veterans. He urged Tian to understand his own value and cooperate to make money together with Tan Run. Tian's demeanor turned ominous as he expressed his hatred for threats. Chen wondered how a mere farmer could have such a terrifying gaze. Tian warned Chen that he should be grateful they hadn't come to the farm together or they wouldn't be alive much longer. Chen dismissed Tian's warning as nonsense, feeling confident in their numbers. Chen demanded Tian cooperate, promising he and his sister would live. Seeing Tian's reluctance to cooperate, Chen ordered his people to cut off Tian's limbs and leave him alive. Those people managed to break through the walls of Tian's farm, causing a noisy disturbance that made Han unable to enjoy her cartoons in peace. She felt an intense urge to silence them once and for all. Meanwhile, Tian found himself alone, battling enemies and hurling them away at a distance. Chen, shocked by the chaos, wondered what was happening. It was evident that the farm possessed anti-personnel weapons, necessitating the need to lure the intruders away. Observing Tian's farm from a distance, a man sensed something was amiss as rocks were being explosively dislodged. His initial suspicion of explosives was confirmed, and he decided to capture Tian alive. He realized no one had truly understood Tian's true strength. Tian himself marveled at the unexpected power boost from the radiation-resistant crops he had consumed for just a few days. His physical attributes, speed, strength, bone density, and reflexes, had all significantly improved beyond his expectations. In ancient times, one could enter the Tao through swordsmanship, but Tian chose to initiate it with a fist. A man swung a knife at Tian, but he sidestepped it, feeling he was moving closer to the Tao. Let's create some space first, he thought, knowing his physical condition was no longer a game. He targeted Chen with his gun. Terrified, Chen regretted his oversight of not bringing a firearm, unaware Tian possessed one. However, if Chen could close the distance, the gun would become useless. He warned Tian not to provoke the powerful figure behind him, stressing the consequences. Tian acknowledged the warning, shooting others to demonstrate Chen's value and eliminate unnecessary threats. As people fled, Tian pursued and killed them. Chen decided to hide in the woods, waiting until Tian ran out of bullets. Dodging attacks, he found refuge behind a rock, realizing Tian had ceased shooting, signaling he was likely out of ammunition, a relief for Chen. Chen remained hidden, plotting a surprise attack on Tian, hoping it would give him a chance to win. Meanwhile, Tian accessed his inventory and retrieved a pistol from the warehouse. He positioned himself above the rock, aiming at Chen. Perplexed, Chen questioned why Tian still possessed a weapon and if he was also a martial artist. The scene shifted to Tian's house, where all intruders lay defeated. Han appeared, 
having ordered the execution of the last intruder whose head was blown off. Concerned about Tian's potential return and his perception of her actions, Han feared that he might view her as violent and reject her. Determined to conceal the scene before Tian returned, she hurried to dispose of the evidence. Outside the door, Chen, severely injured, admitted that threatening Tian with a child had been a grave mistake. He pleaded with Tian to stop tormenting him, promising to reveal everything if spared. Tian replied that letting Chen off the hook was impossible but offered Chen a choice, a quick, painful death or a chance to be cured and continue suffering, since Tian had plenty of bullets and time. Faced with these options, Chen agreed to answer Tian's questions. Tian first asked who was behind the attack. Chen revealed that it was Ling, the CEO of Tan Run. Tian remarked that it made sense given Ling's ruthless nature and his involvement in inflating prices. He then inquired if there was anyone else involved. Chen responded that Ling was solely responsible, keeping the matter well hidden. Even the highest-ranking executives within the company were unaware. Additionally, Chen mentioned Ling's recent disagreements with the company's vice president and his plan to use this situation to elevate his authority and impress the headquarters and the VP from the southern city branch. Tian pondered the headquarters, realizing that Tan Run Pharmaceutical, which monopolized Southern City, was just a subsidiary of a larger group. He struck Chen to wake him up and asked if Ling had reported the matter to the headquarters. Chen denied this, explaining that the other vice president had connections there and Ling feared that escalating the issue would ruin his plans by leaking the information to that vice president. Tian thought that since the matter wasn't widespread, it would be easy to contain. He then demanded that Chen take him to Ling. Chen received a call from Ling, who asked if the mission was completed. Chen responded that they had the target under control, but the target insisted on seeing Ling and the old man before revealing anything. Ling chastised Chen, calling him useless if he couldn't handle such a small matter without his personal involvement. Apologizing, Chen explained that Tian was tight-lipped and they had lost a few men in the process. Ling agreed to meet, instructing Chen to take Tian to warehouse number 78, assuring him he would be there shortly. Chen hung up the call abruptly, angering Ling, who fumed at Chen's audacity. Ling, already at the headquarters, decided to replace Chen immediately. Leaving his office, Ling didn't know that Tian had forced Chen to say those things. Tian then tied Chen up and had Xiao change clothes with him. During the car ride, Xiao thanked Tian. Tian replied that Nan was merely an incidental acquaintance and that Xiao shouldn't get overly sentimental. Xiao apologized. Arriving at the warehouse, Xiao and the bound Chen entered. Ling, accompanied by two men and a tied-up Nan, awaited them. Ling asked why only they had come and where Nan's son was. Xiao explained that the messenger had been knocked out and left in the car and that Chen had a stomach ache so he went to the restroom. Fearing Ling's impatience, Xiao had brought Nan over first. Ling scoffed, calling them a pitiful bunch. He laughed, pointing out Nan's beaten condition and remarked that he must not have struck hard enough before. He demanded Nan speak up, promising to set him free. Nan thought it best to stay silent, knowing Ling wouldn't leave any of them alive. Nan tried to speak, but his mouth was gagged, making it impossible. Infuriated, Ling called Nan a dog and demanded to know why he was barking before kicking him. Xia stared at Ling, trembling. Ling noticed and barked at Xia, asking why he was staring and ordering him to bring Nan over. The other two men continued to kick Nan. Ling sneered, calling them worthless losers. Suddenly, Tian crashed through the roof, landing a kick on Ling. Everyone was stunned. Ling remarked that the wall wasn't easy to climb. Tian pointed his gun at the fallen Ling, causing the two men to freeze in fear. Tian commanded them not to move. Ling demanded to know how Tian had arrived and if Chen had betrayed him. He then dared Tian to touch him. Tian questioned how someone of Ling's intelligence had become the head of Tanrun, suggesting Ling had invested all his skills in being heartless. He revealed that the injured person was Chen. Ling threatened that if Tian touched him, he would have Nan killed immediately. Tian asked if he was sure, pointing out that killing Ling was more cost-effective than saving irrelevant people. Ling ordered his men to save him, but Xia pleaded with Tian to stop. Ignoring the plea, Tian shot the two men, questioning Xia's intelligence. Xia then rushed to free his father. Xia and Nan knelt before Tian, expressing their gratitude and apologies. Xia apologized for not holding Nan accountable for his actions and acknowledged that apologies were inadequate but thanked Tian nonetheless. 
Tian reassured them that he didn't believe in guilt by association and that Nan had not harmed him in any way. Nan blamed himself for not stopping Xia's actions, feeling immense guilt. Tian told Xia that constant apologies weren't necessary and suggested letting go of the idea of seeking forgiveness, as he believed Xia didn't deserve harm. Tian assured Xia that he wouldn't harm him unnecessarily and left the next steps up to Xia. Xia assured Tian that they knew nothing and could be trusted, then asked Tian how he planned to handle the situation. Tian instructed them to gather the people and stack them together, promising to bring the car. Nand asked what Tian intended to do. Tian replied that they had no choice but to clean up the evidence. After gathering the three bodies together, Xia asked Nand if Tian planned to bury them. Nan nodded, pulling Chen aside and agreeing that it wasn't safe to leave them exposed in the middle of nowhere. As Nan reached out to move Chen, Chen unexpectedly attacked him with a broken piece of mirror. Nan managed to dodge the blow, surprised by Chen's agility. Xiao was shocked by the sudden violence. Chen explained that he was at a dead end and had nothing to lose by taking someone down with him. He swung the broken mirror at Nan, but Xiao intervened and took the blow himself. Nan was stunned by Xiao's sacrifice. Just then, Tian arrived in the car and struck Chen with it. Xia screamed in pain and collapsed. Nan began to cry, admitting to Tian that Xia was right about him being useless and not daring to be good or bad. He blamed himself for putting his father in danger due to his selfish desires. Nan accepted that Xia deserved what happened and wished to give his life back to him, finally finding peace. He asked Tian to thank Han for him, mentioning that the candies for Han's food that night were from him, knowing they were something a child would appreciate. With his last breath, Xia passed away. Nan was overwhelmed with grief. After a while, he and Tian set fire to the warehouse and left the scene. The scene shifted to Ran in her office, calmly sipping tea as someone rushed in, clearly agitated. She instructed them to calm down and explain slowly. After composing themselves, the person informed Ran that something significant had occurred. Ren asked what had happened, and they hesitantly revealed that Ling had died. Ren swiftly examined the bodies and asked the doctor if they had confirmed their identities. The doctor confirmed through DNA extracted from dental pulp that the bodies were indeed Ling and Chen. However, the genetic database had no matches for the other bodies, and no missing persons reports matched them. Due to insufficient police resources, further investigation to confirm their identities was not possible. Ren dismissed the importance of confirming identities and instead inquired whether the deaths were accidental or deliberate. The doctor determined they were murders. Several bodies had bullet fragments indicating they were shot before being stacked and set on fire in a car. Some showed signs of torture. Inspecting one of the bodies, Ren concluded that whoever had done this was dealing with a ruthless character. She pondered whether the attack targeted Ling personally or Tan Run Corporation. If the former, she planned to celebrate with two bottles of red wine that night. If the latter, these people were now her enemies. Tian purchased a small bomb and asked Nan if he truly wanted to seek revenge. Nan agreed, declaring he was willing to risk his life for it. Tian then handed the bomb to Nan, explaining that he had taken care of the traces that could be handled but couldn't guarantee that Tan Run wouldn't find any clues pointing to him. This was a reminder not to let what happened to Xia occur again. Nan reassured Tian, promising to ensure the bomb exploded as intended without worry. Tian then confided all the secrets to Nan and returned home with him, calling Han to ask what she was doing there. Nan was bewildered to see Han unfazed by everything, including a robot dog in the house. Outside, Han had arranged a crane and a small sand mound to conceal the bodies. She realized Tian and Nan had returned, denying any wrongdoing and claiming she was only playing a digging game and hadn't set anything off. Tian reprimanded her, having seen everything she had done. This prompted her to admit she lied because she feared he would hate her if he discovered her violent actions, worrying he might not want her anymore. He asked how he could ever not want her. She explained it was because she had killed people. Nan wondered if that was the reason. Tian reassured Han, telling her that no matter what mistake she had made, he would stand by her side and bear them together. He emphasized that from beginning to end, she was the most important person in his family and he was delighted that she knew how to protect herself. He encouraged her to just be herself and assured her that he would guide her so she shouldn't feel burdened. He praised her for dealing with those who had malicious intentions and preventing them from harming others. Han then declared that she would retaliate against those who tried to bully Tian. 
Nan reflected that the world was changing too quickly and he needed to adapt. Han then confided everything to Tien, who confirmed if she was saying that she saw those people wearing red and that this made her hate them. She ordered B to eliminate them, and B agreed, mentioning how those individuals had knocked down the gate and disturbed her while watching cartoons, a color she found unsettling. Tien asked if others also had colors, confirmed by Han describing Tien with a calming blue, Hei with an approachable green, and Shia also associated with the unsettling red color. She mentioned that Nan's color was gray with a hint of green, and she had also noticed that some passers-by were gray too. Tien wondered what the people emitting the red color had in common, suspecting they all harbored ill intentions towards Han. He asked if besides seeing different colors she had noticed any words or letters around them. He wondered if Han was also a player. She denied seeing any words or letters. He asked when she started seeing colors on people. She replied it had been about a week ago. Tien speculated that her ability had emerged only after the start of the destruction season, confirming that Han hadn't seen the system and thus wasn't a player. Thinking about this, he pinched her cheeks, a habit of his when contemplating a problem. Tien believed it was likely an evolution after eating radiation-resistant vegetables. He smiled, and she jokingly commented on how scary he could be. He expressed his happiness. Tien considered that if that were the case, the crops provided by the food system didn't have the same side effects as the radiative crops, but the likelihood of mutation was higher. They had both eaten radiation-resistant food for only a few days, yet their physical functions had improved significantly. Han had also evolved the ability to perceive others' emotions akin to a proximity program or humanoid reconnaissance device. Tian named his ability the Eye of Truth and dubbed Han's ability the Eye of Good and Evil. He expressed admiration for her ability and noted its usefulness to him. When she asked if she would be able to help him in the future, he agreed, affirming that if she saw someone emitting red color in the future, she should inform him as she was his strongest assistant. As he gently touched her, she became happy. He then asked if she was hungry and offered to cook for her. Later, he prepared all the food, and the three of them sat down together to eat. Tien told Han that from now on, Nan would also live with them and help with the farm work. Nan mentioned he didn't fully understand the situation but would do as Tien instructed. Han was delighted to hear this and asked where Nan would live. Nan replied that he would build a thatched hut near the gate to live in and keep watch over it. Han then asked what would happen to Shia now that Nan was living with them. Nan explained that Shia had gone to another world to atone for his sins. Han remarked that it seemed those who emitted red light and wanted to bully Tien wouldn't live long. She vowed that anyone who dared to bully Tien or Hei would face Ba's retaliation. Tien praised Han for her intelligence and suggested she focus on her meal. Nan thought that things couldn't get any more intense than they were now. Furthermore, his hands were already stained with blood, but now he didn't have to worry as long as he could help his son get revenge. He was willing to be Tien's watchdog. The scene shifts to a man watching a press conference. A speaker announced that it was the 15th day after the catastrophe, with a cumulative death toll of 38.6 million on Blue Star and 4.7 million in the Yen Hang Federation. The federal government was actively transferring grain reserves, and soilless cultivation technology would soon be scaled up for production. He urged everyone not to panic. The man's son approached and asked what he could do. The man inquired if he had read Ren's report. The boy confirmed and mentioned that Liang was dead. The man remarked about Tien being a good earner and lamented his death, noting that the mutation process had accelerated. He mentioned that the military police headquarters had captured a level 5 mutated beast in the mountains on the southern border. Jing, his son, was surprised to hear this and asked how a level 5 mutant beast could have evolved when the highest level they could research now was only level 3. It was the result of his artificial catalysts in the deep forest with no human intervention to clear it. Radioactive vegetation thrived, and even the lowest level species cannibalized each other, accelerating mutation intensity. The father remarked that their current manufacturing technology was vulnerable to unknown natural evolution. He instructed Jing to take over the lab there, and Ren had discovered that Liang's secret experiments had utilized many intriguing technologies. They planned to combine these discoveries with their current resources and ensure the prompt extraction of the virus. Jing agreed with the plan. Ren sat in her office pondering that the records from two days prior had appeared entirely routine, suggesting that the cause of his death lay within that narrow window. However, the surveillance footage from those crucial days had been deleted by Liang, leaving them bereft of clues. Dwelling on this seemed futile. 
For now, they needed to decide on the location of the new research institute, and Ren still had to welcome the incoming leader. Stepping outside, she greeted Jing, who arrived from the south. After a handshake and introduction, Ren noticed a man standing behind Jing and inquired about him. Jing explained he was Kue, Jing's assistant. Jing then mentioned hearing about a suitable research institute from Ren and asked to see it. She agreed, mentioning a few locations on the city outskirts from which he could choose. Meanwhile, the scene shifted to Tian, who was inspecting the fish livestock in the pond. Tian had fish ranging from level 1 to level 5 and marveled at the variety of species available. He noted that the points required to purchase different types of fish at the same level remained consistent. Suddenly, he spotted a bluefin tuna and rare pre-apocalyptic ingredients available for 500 points. Excitedly, Tian asked Han if she liked eating bluefin tuna. She inquired if it was the expensive fish that melts in the mouth. Tian confirmed this and mentioned that they previously couldn't afford much, but now they could indulge as they pleased. Han joyfully expressed her desire to eat it. Tian gathered his equipment and suggested they use the excavator to dig a fish pond together. Han agreed enthusiastically, and Hei joined them with the excavator. Tian, Han, Hei, and Nan arrived at an open area. Tian instructed them to start digging there. Nan rubbed Hei and asked about its age, noticing it had grown significantly. Tian explained that Hei had already reached adulthood and shouldn't have been growing any larger. Nan speculated whether Hei had gained weight due to the farm's good food. Recalling when Hei first arrived and only reached Nan's knees, it now reached up to their thighs. Tian agreed, realizing that daily proximity had made the gradual changes less noticeable. Fearing potential mutations like B, he reassured them that all poisonous crops had been disposed of since B's accident. Tian considered if Hei had evolved from consuming radiation-resistant crops like Han, resolving to monitor him closely to prevent any issues. Just then, Tian noticed a visitor approaching and wondered who it could be. As he turned to check, Nan asked what had caught his attention. Tian noted two men and a woman approaching with a threat level of eight. It was Ren, Jing, and Kue. Jing knocked at the gate, and Ren questioned Jing if he truly needed to inspect the new location she had selected, emphasizing the enhanced equipment and security they offered. Jing affirmed the farm's excellent location and adequate size, intending to finalize the purchase before transferring operations there. Ren acquiesced to Jing's preference. She thought that despite his smile, he was difficult to engage with, not even acknowledging the effort she had put into securing those few places. She mentioned it had been a while since anyone had shown interest, doubting they would appear now. Jing instructed Kue to keep knocking, determined to get Tian's attention. When Tian arrived and inquired about their business, Jing identified Tian as the owner and expressed a need to discuss business face-to-face -face inside the gate. Tian refused, insisting they speak from where they stood and to make it quick as he was busy. Jing conceded, attributing the urgency to the chaos outside. Ren, puzzled by Tian's demeanor, introduced herself as the general manager of Tian Run Company and clarified their intention to purchase the farm, asking about his price. Tian wondered how they had found his farm already. Ren stated that they would meet Tian's demands regarding his price or any other conditions, even offering him a place in the villa area of the city center if he needed it. Tian firmly declined expressing his preference for staying where he was. Ren pressed him to hear their offer, hinting that being from the southern side, Tian might recognize Tian Run's reputation and potentially change his mind. Tian reiterated his contentment with his current situation, stating that not even a mountain of gold would sway him. Kue, frustrated, slammed the gate in anger, triggering a security alert on Tian's system. The warning indicated a minor attack with a strength of two and asked if Tian wanted to retaliate. Tian declined, noting that Kue could easily trigger a serious response with just one punch. Jing scolded Kue and slapped him, reminding him of their leader's teachings and warning him against such behavior without permission. Kue apologized, acknowledging his mistake. Tian found the situation intriguing. Jing reassured Tian not to take it personally, describing Kue as ignorant. Tian dismissed the incident and invited Kue closer to the gate. As Kue approached, Tian swiftly struck him with precision using his hummingbird technique, knocking Kuei to his knees. Tian quipped that Kuei had punched his gate and in return, Tian had punched him back, suggesting they were now even. He then indicated they should leave if there was nothing else. Jing, silent but smiling, didn't protest. 
Jing wrote a brief note apologizing for the inconvenience caused to Tian and expressing regret for the trouble they had caused. He also included his phone number, suggesting Tian could contact him if he changed his mind. Ren thought Tian's dismissal was rude and assumed he wouldn't call. She noticed Tian had torn up the note containing Jing's number, feeling determined not to be looked down upon. As they got into their car to leave, Tian pondered the unexpected speed with which Tian Run had located his farm. He wondered if they were specifically searching for him or if it was merely coincidental. Tian resolved to retrieve the hummingbird guard number one and observe their departure, thinking they would meet again soon. With only about ten days until the next destructive season, Tian noted the stable output of the plantation area and the commencement of excavation in the aquatic area. He planned to develop a livestock area as well, preparing for the future challenges ahead. After cooking the food, Tian sat down to eat. Han asked him to try the sesame sauce she had made, praising its deliciousness. Tian acknowledged her effort and took a bite, agreeing that it was indeed delicious. Han mentioned how comforting mutton hot pot was in winter, to which Tian shared his fondness for its warmth. Nan questioned if they were dressed appropriately for the current climate and expressed concern about the land's decreasing cultivability. Tian hinted that Han had long been curious about something, but he couldn't divulge further details. Nand understood and assured Tian he wouldn't pry into his secrets. Tian explained that he wanted Nan to mentally prepare because the food they were eating wasn't ordinary. It could lead to changes in the body over time, such as improved immunity to cold, enhanced physical fitness, and possibly even unusual abilities. Tian looked forward to seeing Nan's potential transformations. Nan asked what Tian was talking about, noting it sounded like something from a science fiction movie. Tian explained that the apocalypse was akin to such stories becoming reality, and considering the existence of fossils, it wouldn't be far-fetched to imagine ancient powers. He likened it to evolution rather than something supernatural. Nan admitted he didn't fully grasp Tian's explanation and suggested they continue eating. He then inquired if anyone had visited that day. Tian confirmed it was representatives from Tian Run. Nan was surprised and remarked on the implications. He half-jokingly wondered if even he, as an old and seemingly useless man, could benefit from the farm's food. Tian agreed, advising Nan to rest early while he went out for errands. Tian searched for the location of Hummingbird No. 1 and discovered it was in the Harmony Villa district. Meanwhile, the scene shifted to Ren, who brought Jing and Kue to her house. She assured them they could stay the night and promised to arrange accommodations for them the next day. Jing thanked her, expressing concern about the trouble. Ren informed Jing and Kue that they would be staying downstairs in one of the four available rooms, allowing them to choose whichever they preferred. She promised to have dinner prepared and delivered to their rooms. Jing agreed with her arrangements and headed upstairs, urging Ren to rest early as well. Meanwhile, the small hummingbird from Tian's possession hovered around Ren, which annoyed her. She wondered aloud why there were mosquitoes in such cold weather. After taking a bath, Ren felt her face looked exhausted from the long day. She decided to pamper herself with a skincare spa session after a refreshing shower. While staring at herself in the mirror, she questioned whether a successful and beautiful woman like herself left any room for others. Applying a face mask, she noticed the mosquito still buzzing around, mistaking the sound for a beetle. Ren decided to open the window to let it fly out, enjoying the refreshing breath of fresh air after the air conditioner had been on for a while. As she opened the window, she suddenly noticed a boy standing outside next to it, startling her. The boy leaped inside. Ren tried to ask for help, but he stopped her by covering her mouth. She wondered if there were any bodyguards outside. The boy made her lie down. She thought that she would fire all those guards. The boy was so strong that she couldn't move or fight him. She had to calm him first. He warned her that he would let her go, but only if she didn't scream or resist. Otherwise, he threatened he would act faster than her bodyguards with his knife. Ren tried to calm down. As the boy released her mouth, she told him that there was a lot of money, jewelry, and gold in the bedside cabinet. He could take it all as long as he didn't harm her. She promised not to involve the police. The boy commented that she seemed very cooperative. Ren told him that the world revolved around seeking wealth, and hurting her would only bring trouble. If he took the money and left quickly, it would be enough for him to buy plenty of food. The boy replied that he hadn't come to rob her. She was shocked and then asked if he was a pervert, making a fake excuse not to cooperate with him. The boy stopped her and asked if she had sent someone to kill Liang, 
questioning why it had taken her so long to discover the murderer. She thought it wasn't a robbery and asked if he was connected to Liang. She pondered that all of Liang's confidants were dead, wondering where he came from. The boy replied that Liang had done him a favor, and now he sought revenge. He had heard that Ren was investigating Liang's death and asked her to share all the information she had, as he wanted to investigate too. She realized the boy had come to voice his accusation. She explained that she and the police were investigating Liang's death, but the clues were limited and there was no way to pinpoint the real culprit so quickly. The boy said she had taken over Liang's position after his death, suggesting she might be responsible. She was shocked, realizing she had no evidence and had made many enemies in the southern side. It seemed natural for someone to take advantage of the chaos and exact revenge on Liang, who was so tragically killed. She insisted she had no deep grudge against him, and his position as general manager wasn't worth killing over. The boy thought Ren was right and acknowledged her intelligence. He couldn't believe they didn't have any suspects. Ren explained there were truly no suspects. Liang had destroyed all documents and surveillance related to recent conspiracies. How could she pinpoint a suspect when she didn't know whom he had been interacting with before his death? It was a challenging matter for her. The boy speculated that Liang wanted everything for himself, leaving no clues behind. She asked if he would let her go. Just as he heard footsteps, the boy swiftly struck Ren's neck, causing her to collapse. Outside, Kue pounded on the door to break it down, while the maid informed Ren that the alarm system had been triggered, indicating something had happened. Ki asked him to save Ren. Upon entering the room, they found Ren lying there. The maid checked on Ren while Ki inspected the window and instructed Jing not to let the boy escape. The boy thought about how the imposing Ki had managed to break down the door. Jing remarked that breaking into a girl's bedroom in the middle of the night was rude. The boy saw Jing and asked how he had found him, as he had left no trace behind. Jing replied that when the boy stepped on the gravity-sensing device at the window, he had asked Ki to block the door. If the boy didn't want a face-to-face -face confrontation, Jing reasoned, he would likely try to escape through the window, which would be his only route out. The boy admired Jing's cleverness but wondered if a mere bean sprout like him could stop him. He rushed at Jing, but Jing blocked the blow and counterattacked. Jing, with scars on his leg, remarked that it was interesting how the bones in his arm were nothing compared to his knee. He calculated that his forearm's ulna and radius should be fractured from the frontal impact force of 700 kilograms, and his carpal joints should be crushed and dislocated due to their inability to absorb such force. Yet, there were no signs of injury. Jing asked if the boy had practiced martial arts, noting he hadn't seen any special techniques. Confused, Jing demanded an answer from the boy, otherwise he wouldn't let him go that night. The boy's hands trembled as he faced Jing. He wondered if Jing had ever practiced martial arts, as he couldn't believe Jing had actually stopped his punch despite his current physical capabilities surpassing those of a normal human. It was troublesome to be entangled with a skilled fighter. They heard people approaching and discussing the sounds they had heard. The boy apologized to Jing, saying he didn't have time to play, and threatened that next time they met, he would beat Jing to death. Jing leaped to attack, but the boy threw dust to obscure Jing's vision. Jing coughed, giving the boy a chance to escape, taunting Jing to wash his eyes while he left. Furious, Jing barely managed to open his eyes and saw the boy jumping off the wall to depart, saying goodbye. Jing's companions arrived and asked if he was okay and if he had let the boy escape. Jing, still recovering, marveled at the boy's intelligence and near superhuman physical condition, acknowledging his excellent martial arts skills. Determined, Jing vowed to find him. Jing reassured them that he was fine, just needing to wash his face. He instructed them to be cautious and asked if they should pursue the boy. Jing declined, noting the boy's speed would make it impossible to catch him. He then inquired about Ren's condition. The guard checked on her and reported back that it wasn't serious. The boy had only knocked her unconscious. He advised giving her pills from the medicine cabinet upon waking, as the dosage was already written on them. The maid suggested calling the police, but Jing reasoned that the southern side was too chaotic and involving the authorities might cause trouble for their comrades in the army and police force. The maid agreed, expressing gratitude and commenting on the chaotic state of the world. Ki arrived with bad news, stating that he had checked the room and discovered a missing hard drive. Jing questioned if it was the grey hard drive that had been plugged into his computer, which Ki confirmed. The third boy, Tien, returned home, thinking that disconnecting the network cable would ensure no problems. 
He wanted to understand what Tian Run Company truly intended. Plugging the hard drive into his laptop, he discovered experimental files and wondered if Jing was a researcher. Opening the files, he found that despite numerous creatures dying as a result, Jing still fervently believed that the world would be better than before. Tian realized it wasn't a confidential document from Tian Run. He read about the radioactive food causing dramatic changes in the limbs and body shapes of beasts and humans. These changes weren't merely catastrophic. They brought about evolution. Jing believed they had taken the wrong evolutionary path, leading to premature deaths. He was determined to find the correct path, even at the cost of human lives, believing it would usher humanity into a new stage of civilization. In this future, humans wouldn't be separated due to terminal illnesses or born prematurely with congenital anomalies. They wouldn't be seen as burdens due to their lack of strength. They would possess strength rivaling tigers and leopards, living to be over a hundred years old. Whether death or supreme glory awaited them at the end of the road, they would face it fearlessly. The scene shifts to Jing and Qi, who report no luck with their search. Jing speculates that the other party may have used some means to evade detection or they might not have accessed the contents of the hard drive yet. The mother disk wasn't receiving any signals from the daughter disk at all. Qi asked if the information was important. Jing dismissed it, saying the hard drive was from the old days and difficult for outsiders to understand. Jing worried he couldn't turn back now. If his notes were discovered, they might realize he had come to the southern side for something real. Qi remarked to Jing that it seemed too coincidental they were attacked upon arriving in the southern side and identified the attacker as Number 7. Jing replied that if Number 7 truly wanted to take action against them, he wouldn't have sent such a rookie. The person had strong physical fitness but lacked refined skills. Ahead lay darkness with an abyss behind them. There was no turning back. Meanwhile, Tian noted it was November 21, 2025, in the Yen Guang calendar. He pondered that Jing's ideas resonated with him, but the arrogance of sacrificing human lives troubled him. He wondered if they had already begun human experiments. Tian has a level 1 Bamama Shan pig cub, a level 1 Windsor rabbit cub, and a level 1 Qing Yen chicken cub. When he shows them to Han, she lights up and asks him where he got those cute little animals. Tian thinks she might not understand a complicated explanation, so he wonders how to explain it to her. Then he gets an idea. He tells her that he has a Doran treasure bag and can take out anything he wants from it. She gets really excited and asks if it's true. He assures her that it is. Tian then tells her to keep it a secret between them. She agrees. He is surprised at how quickly she understood. Then he sees Han holding the rabbit cub and playing with it. He tells her not to play around with their precious food and to put it back in the shed quickly. She is shocked to hear the rabbit is for food and begs him not to cook it because it's so cute and still so small. Tian tells her about the spicy rabbit meat. Then he talks about pork bacon burgers, Han chicken rice, grilled chicken legs, sautéed diced rabbit with pickled pepper, chicken pot pork chow rice, spicy rabbit pot, and rice with pepper ginger rabbit. Han realizes she might have to become a vegetarian. She hesitates but Tian tells her to be grateful for the hard-earned food and to eat everything without leaving any bite. He explains that forming relationships with the animals can be painful, so it's best to leave that to him. He extends his hand, and she gives the rabbit back, promising that from now on she will eat everything without leaving a single bite. Tian is then congratulated because the plantation has produced a rare product, albino corn, so they need to harvest it as soon as possible. He wonders about this rare product and what it might be. Tian tells Han to go ahead and play while he checks out the cornfield. She agreed and left. Tian checked and discovered that the albino corn was a level 2 rare item, a single-use consumable. It was an extremely rare mutated product from anti-radiation corn, with a probability of 1 in 100,000. Its effect was to put the user into a state of rage, increasing strength, speed, and reflexes tenfold for 30 seconds. Tian thought about how going on a rampage with 10 times the strength for 30 seconds was just like Popeye's spinach. He wondered if there was only one or if there might be more rare products, so he searched several places. He was disappointed, realizing that this kind of rare product was really hard to find and could only be produced when they were very lucky while planting seeds. The system never mentioned anything about special products. Tian thought that finding the albino corn was a nice surprise. It seemed necessary to do some intensive farming to increase their yield. Wouldn't that increase the chances of producing rare products from the corn? 
but then he realized that this might be putting the cart before the horse. Increasing the amount planted would certainly increase the probability of producing rare products, but it could also worsen the overall quality of the crops and might produce a large number of weak and dead plants. He decided that he had to farm honestly and not rely on shortcuts. What he needed most now were points, and rare products could be considered the icing on the cake. The scene shifted to Ren, who was resting and thinking about the thief who came to her home asking about Liang. She vowed to track him down and cut him into pieces. She cursed her security guards, calling them idiots for failing to capture a single man despite their numbers. The military and the police had no extra manpower to investigate, so if she wanted to uncover the thief's identity, she couldn't use formal means. Ren remembered that she had one of his hairs, which got stuck on her clothes. It was too light to be hers, so it must belong to the thief who attacked her that night. She tried hard not to think of him but was determined to catch him somehow. Then she went downstairs, telling Jing that she wanted to talk to him. Jing, who was reading a book and having tea, looked up and asked if she was feeling better. She sat down, thanked him, and said that the massage techniques he taught her were really effective. She didn't feel any pain at all that day. She informed him that she had already secured a location for his research institute. It wasn't far from the main area and used to be a factory. Due to sudden changes, it closed down and was sold to them at a very low price. Its location was excellent, quiet, and remote, perfectly meeting Jing's requirements. Jing apologized and said that since she came to see him, he was sure there was something else she wanted to talk about. She agreed and admitted that it was a bit embarrassing. She thought Jing, being an expert in biological research, must be able to do DNA systematic comparisons. She asked if he could help her find a DNA match for a hair sample from the southern side. He replied that if she wanted to compare it to the entire southern side, it would be like finding a needle in a haystack. It would take a long time to compare around 100,000 samples, and just collecting the DNA samples from all those people would be a huge task. He then asked if the person was important. She replied that it wasn't that important, she just wanted to find the intruder who attacked her. But if it was too difficult, they could just leave it. Jing then said it wasn't hard and he would surely help her with that. She thanked him and asked if she was troubling him. Jing was experimenting and found that the dilution of the injected reagent was 10%. After completing the injection, the experimental subject's muscle fibers appeared significantly thicker, with cellular activity increasing thousands of times. They created a monster with compound eyes as the subject's genes had been contaminated by other organisms. The experimental subjects seemed to enter a violent state and broke free from their restraints. Experiment V virus B, the 34th, failed, causing glass to shatter and immediate destruction. In a dream, Jing recalled a past party where some boys were talking. One asked why Jing was left alone. The other boy, Jing's brother Jim, warned them not to speak ill of his brother calling him a bastard. They planned to tease Jing by holding his face in water, deciding to hold him tightly until he drank it all, humiliating him. Jing's brother instructed the others holding him to be gentle and leave no marks, reminding them that despite being a bastard, Jing carried the surname by and had to live up to their father's expectations. Others agreed, and Jing, coughing and crying, asked his brother to leave him alone. They mocked Jing, angering his brother further. Jing woke up in bed, sweating and pleading not to be hurt, realizing it was just a dream. Nowadays, V-shaped viruses had become more stable, and Jing believed that once he could create the perfect mutant, he would be closer to surpassing his brother. The scene shifted to Tian's house, where Han was watching the news. The report stated that it had been 19 days since the world changed and numerous mutated livestock carcasses, over 100 in number and of unknown origin, were found piled up in N town. The epidemic department had already disposed of the remains. Tian asked why she wasn't watching cartoons and if she had started watching the news. She replied that she was tired of being treated like a child and had been following the news, asserting that she couldn't always hide behind him. He told her that she could see people's evil thoughts, which was already helping him. She smiled and said she wanted to catch up quickly and help him more. As he was getting stronger, Han needed to get stronger too. Tian had been observing Han for a while and noticed she didn't tend to go berserk. The changes in her body shape seemed to be due to evolution from the anti-radiation products, which relieved him. He mentioned that he and Nan were going to continue digging the pond, so when Han got hungry, she could eat some snacks. An hour later, feeling a bit hungry, Han noticed a small box on the table and wondered what it was. Opening it, 
she found divine grain seeds level 4. Tian had mentioned that he and Nan were growing the nuts. She showed Han that there were two, one for each of them. She tried one and fed the other to Han. Finding it bitter, she spat it out because it was hard to eat, needing to rinse her mouth after eating it. Han felt very sleepy and unwell. At night, as everyone slept, Han barked a lot, waking Nan, who wondered what the sound was. Turning on the light, Nan saw that Han was vomiting blood and then turned, appearing mutated. She rushed to attack Nan. Nan managed to save himself somehow and wondered what had happened to Han. She seemed so different from earlier. Nan thought she had truly turned into a wolf because of the mutation, but it seemed different from the usual cases. Seeing no immediate signs of further aggression, Nan tried to calm her down. He reassured her that he was her uncle Nan. Han looked around, and Nan observed her actions. Nan asked if she was hungry and offered to bring some food for her. Han barked, startling Nan. Breaking through the window, Han jumped outside and then effortlessly scaled the high fence to escape. Nan was surprised by her agility. Tian arrived, asking what had happened. Nan explained that Han had suddenly gone wild and run outside. He didn't understand why Han had suddenly gone crazy, but she didn't resemble any other mutant animal he had seen, and she seemed to recognize him. Tian was shocked and confused to hear this. Han joined them, calling out to both of them. She realized that Han was gone and woke up to find her missing from beside her bed. She asked what they were doing outside. Tian reassured her not to worry, suggesting that Han might have been bored from staying home for so long and might return after running around a bit. He encouraged her to go back to sleep, assuring her everything would be okay. Han refused, noting that Han never left her side when she slept and asked what Uncle Nan meant by getting crazy. Tian noticed her bare feet and lifted her up, expressing concern. She explained her worry about Han potentially becoming like Ba as well. Tian advised her not to overthink it and asked if Han had eaten anything unusual recently. She replied that they usually ate farm food and also had some of Tian's box with the growing nuts in the afternoon. Tian wondered if she meant the level 4 divine grain seeds and speculated that Han might have evolved. He questioned why she had become agitated and then asked his system if consuming the level 4 grain seeds could have side effects causing loss of control. Finding that the system wasn't responding, Tian grew concerned. Tian told Han that he would go and bring Han back, asking her to be good and return to bed with Grandpa Nan. She insisted that he had to bring Han back. Tian reassured her not to worry, promising to bring Han back safely because she was family. Han kept running and felt increasingly hot. Something was happening to her eyes. She thought about biting the throats of all living creatures but knew she couldn't harm humans or she wouldn't be able to return to her master. A woman in an overcoat recognized Han as a sacred animal from the Oracle and felt compelled to bring her back, believing it would please God. Tian searched on his bike for Han while his patrol mosquitoes reported they hadn't found her yet. He realized Han must have left the area and needed to find her quickly. If the military police found Han, they would likely kill her. Then the woman approached Tian, having seen Han, and asked if he was looking for the black wolf dog and if she belonged to him. Tian asked if she had seen where Han went. The woman asked if he knew the truth behind the apocalypse. Confused and focused on finding Han, Tian insisted that the woman just tell him where the dog went, emphasizing that he wasn't interested in anything else. The lady explained that the disasters were punishment for humanity's sins and that the apocalypse wouldn't end until all humans were extinct. She suggested that Tian could save himself by joining their self-help society and making a sincere confession to God for a chance at survival. Tian wondered if this was some kind of new missionary scam and asked if there were any conditions for joining the society. She replied that their self-help society had a hierarchy of membership, with different levels requiring varying fees ranging from 3 to 300,000 units. The higher the level, the closer one was believed to be to God and the greater the chance of salvation. However, since Tian was the master of the sacred animals, she suggested he could simply bring that animal to join the club. Tian retorted that she should study more about brainwashing and deception before trying to deceive people. Offended, she asked how he dared to disrespect God. Tian shrugged it off, stating he had no time to entertain her and questioned if salvation could be achieved through piety, asserting that it was up to individuals to save themselves. With that, he walked away. As Tian left, she commented that those who didn't believe in God would suffer eternal damnation in hell, considering him the lowest of the low. Tian was reminded of the past when he was standing on the side of the road, 
smoking next to his car. Suddenly, he heard a noise and went to investigate, finding a dog lying there with blood around it. Tien thought it might have been hit by a car while crossing the road. Nearby, he saw a very cute and small dog next to the dead one. Tien picked up the small dog and couldn't believe it was still alive. It seemed the dead dog was the small one's mother and had been dead for a few days, yet the small dog was surprisingly resilient. He took the adorable puppy in his hand and remarked that many people had lost their parents just like this puppy. His thoughts were interrupted as the puppy bit a man's leg, causing the man to scream. Nearby, some men with equipment were present. One of them suggested shaking things up, saying Xiao wouldn't be able to hold on much longer. Jing arrived and asked how the mutated beasts got in. The man explained that Xiao had become addicted to smoking and had gone into the woods to smoke, flicking his cigarette butt at the beast, which caused it to become violent and attack him. Jing asked how they dared to let such a thing happen. The man replied that the beast wasn't hiding in the bushes, and Xiao hadn't noticed it until later. They had already contacted the military police to handle the situation. Jing asked him to repeat himself, questioning if they were saying the mutant was lurking in the bushes. The man confirmed this. Jing thought that low-level mutant beasts would simply wander around aimlessly, following the heat of living creatures, indicating this might be a high-level mutant beast. Moreover, the mutant only bit the security guard's leg without killing him, suggesting it knew the danger of guns and was trying to use the guards as a shield, which was terrifyingly clever. If they captured and studied it, they might be able to break through the instability of the virus. This was the perfect mutant beast Jing had been looking for. Jing ordered them to gather all available men and capture the mutant beast alive before the military police arrived. They were to be equipped with tranquilizer guns and sedatives, emphasizing that the beast had to be captured alive. Jing distributed guns to everyone and cautioned them to be careful, aiming for the limbs as they fired shots. Hei managed to dodge some but was hit and started running away. Jing ordered them to chase after him. Meanwhile, Tian was at home when the second hummingbird report came in, indicating large dog paw prints found approximately 700 meters southeast. Tian rushed to the location and examined the paw prints. He noticed traces of fresh blood and deduced that they had not been there long, likely belonging to Hei. He wondered what had happened and how Hei had been injured so severely. The people from Jing's group were chasing Rael, the dog, in their cars. Jing thought that no mutated animal could move so fast, and he was excited to observe its muscular tone while running, admiring the creature's beauty. He was determined to catch the dog. Meanwhile, Tien spotted Hei and ordered the hummingbird to show him. He saw Hei being chased by cars and, upon zooming in, recognized Jing among the people in the cars. Tien wondered why Jing was after Hei and if he wanted to capture Hei for research. Tien took out an Alban core from his inventory, determined that those people wouldn't get away with it. The pursuers were shooting at Hei, who dodged their attacks as he continued ahead. Jing contacted the other two cars in his group and instructed them to surround Hei from both sides, aiming to drive him into the old factory up ahead. They agreed and moved into position. As they prepared to execute the plan, Hei spotted them and used a tree for support to jump over one of the cars, causing it to crash. A man fired a bullet towards Hei, but Tien swiftly moved in with white light blazing around him, using his power to intercept and block the shot. He realized that after consuming the Alban core and entering a frenzy state, he had 26 seconds remaining before it wore off. Hei wondered if the person blocking the shot was Tien. Jing was astonished to see the white light surrounding Tien. Tien knew he had only 26 seconds left and swiftly moved to take down all the men before the effect wore off completely. Jing was shocked by Tien's sudden prowess. With just five seconds remaining, Tien closed in and delivered a powerful punch, causing Jing to fall. As the 26 seconds elapsed, Tien moved back, sensing there might be side effects from using the Alban core. Jing realized how close he had come to danger and decided Tien was too dangerous to be left alive. He aimed his gun at Tien, and the bullet hit Tien just as Hei launched an attack on Jing. As Tien regained consciousness, he found himself lying on top of Hei, who was walking at the time. He asked how Hei was doing, trying to access the system, but discovered it wasn't responding. He then noticed something white appearing around Hei and capturing him. Tien wondered what it was. The scene shifted to Jing, who was lying down receiving treatment. Someone apologized explaining that the situation had been dire. Jing had suffered a severe blow to the head, 
causing confusion in his pituitary gland and squeezing the blood vessels in his brain, including a fatal wound to his neck. It was considered miraculous that Jing had survived thus far. Another person apologized to Ren, stating they had done their best, but Jing's prognosis remained uncertain. Ren interrupted, reminding them it was their duty as guards to protect researcher Jing's safety with their lives. Now, Jing lay in a hospital bed, his fate hanging in the balance. Another man apologized to Ren, explaining that Jing was determined to capture the mutant animals and had taken off first with the advanced team. By the time they arrived, the advanced team had already suffered heavy losses, with only Decoy managing to survive. Ren cut him off, saying she didn't want to hear excuses. She asked if the man had witnessed the attacks firsthand. He denied it, saying it was too fast, just a white light. Ren turned sharply to him, warning him to come up with a credible story before trying to deceive anyone. The man apologized again, insisting he wasn't lying. Ren reminded him that they were paid well and that she wasn't interested in hearing his excuses. The doctor reported that Jing's condition was deteriorating, with his heart rate dropping and another hematoma found in his brain. Ren instructed them to do everything possible to save him. The doctor replied that it was futile and that Jing couldn't be saved. Ren insisted they give him a shot of adrenaline so he could communicate any last thoughts. Jing managed to open his eyes and called out to Decoy, who confirmed he was there. Jing requested to be injected with a V-shaped virus. Dawei refused, explaining that there had been no successful human trials, and if it failed, Jing would not rest peacefully in his grave with a complete human body. Jing argued that dying as a human or a monster was the same to him, and he didn't want to lose like this. They decided to inject 5 milliliters of the V-shaped virus into Jing and prepared shackles and a bomb neck collar. They asked Jing if he wanted them to call his family. Jing replied that there was no need. His family was just those who shared his blood, but that wasn't his home. He instructed them to proceed. As the doctors injected the V-shaped virus into him, Jing screamed loudly, his body convulsing. Ren was surprised by the intensity of his reaction, while Dawei remained silent, hoping for the best. The scene shifted to Tien, where Hei was encased in a white substance that suddenly broke apart. Hei evolved into a half-man and emerged outside. Tien wondered where Hei was. Hei tapped Tien on the shoulder. The scene then shifted to Han and Nan. Nan told Han to go to bed and not wait for Tien. He mentioned that Hei couldn't have gone far and that Tien would bring him back soon. He added that it would be bad if she caught a cold in such cold weather. She replied that she wouldn't catch a cold because she was healthy and would wait for Tien to come back. She asked Grandpa Nan to hold her hand because it was warm. As he held it, he found it really warm and was amazed at how much a person's health could improve by eating food from the farm. She told him she was an evolved superwoman. Nan took her to sit on his lap, saying he'd accompany her while they waited for Tien. As they waited, morning came, and they both fell asleep sitting like that. Han heard a sound, rushed outside, called for Tien, and asked if he had found Hei. She then saw Hei carrying Tien and asked what had happened to Tien. Tien replied that he had brought Hei back. Nan arrived and was surprised by this. Tien then helped Hei put on normal human clothes. As Han looked at Hei from all sides, she commented that Hei had changed a lot. The fur was so thick, but Hei still had the familiar blue color. He lifted her to sit on his shoulder, thinking Han was still so naughty. Tien learned that Hei was a Czech wolf dog with human genes, genetically evolved with potentially unlimited data improvement. Tien understood that Hei had lost control previously due to atavistic genes causing him to go berserk, which is why he had escaped to avoid hurting them. Integrating human genetics could have occurred during that time. As Tien was injured, Nan brought the medicine box. Tien asked to sterilize the knife and then dig out the bullet. Nan handed it to him and asked if Tien was going to dig it out directly and what if it got infected. Tien told him to just leave everything to him. Tien dug out the bullet and considered retrieving ancient gray medicinal carrots. He produced a carrot in his hand, shocking Nan with its sudden appearance. Tien ate it, and Nan wondered if it was a miracle cure. The wound on Tien's shoulder healed, and his broken bone restored, leaving only pain behind. Tien thought about how genetic cells in all living creatures constantly replace and divide. On the plateau, old cells die, and new ones replace them to sustain life. During this process of division and replication, cells are mostly stable and faithfully replicate all elements of the old cell. 
However, under certain conditions, stability may be disrupted, and a new generation of cells may suddenly appear at a site, replacing the original generation. This is known as a genetic mutation. Genetic mutations are categorized into two outcomes. The first is beneficial development, like TN, Han, and He, which allows their bodies to gain new and advantageous functions in addition to their original ones. TN considered this as evolution. The second outcome is bad development, like many mutated animals in the world currently. They have terrifyingly strong limbs and great strength, but their genes contain fatal flaws. Even if they are lucky enough to regain their senses, they won't live long. That's just the harsh reality of survival. The scene shifted to Jing waking up and wondering if he had survived. Others said it was a miracle, as no human had ever remained conscious after being injected with a V-virus. Jing's survival at that time meant their experiment would move to the next stage, and he was congratulated for it. Jing explained that it wasn't simple. Even though he survived, it didn't mean that the V-shaped virus mutated him perfectly. His mutation still failed, and while he had greater strength and speed compared to normal, his body structure was still altered for the worse. At most, he had seven days to live. If he couldn't find a perfectly mutated creature and obtain its DNA by the second day, he was still facing death. Tian prepared himself, his upper body ribs forming a protective structure on his back. Dawei arrived and informed them that a detective from the Southern Military Police Bureau was present. He questioned whether it would be appropriate for them to investigate the intruder and alert the military. Jing responded by stating his proficiency in boxing, Muay Thai, grappling, Shaolin, and several other deadly martial arts. He also possessed a 65-kilogram golden dragon badge from the Federal Sano Association. His reflexes and physical fitness were more than 2.8 times that of an average adult. In other words, he could already be considered one of the strongest people in the world, and there were few who could defeat him head-on. However, the person who attacked him couldn't be considered human at all. His power source was similar to that of the perfect mutant wolf dog, indicating he might also be a perfect mutant. Perhaps their perfect mutations originated from the same source, which could explain why he came to rescue the wolf dog. That person's movements reminded Jing of the other guy from before. Decoy asked if Jing suspected that those two were the same person but wondered if it was wise to reveal their hard-earned research results. Jing replied that he knew what he was doing. The V-virus hadn't allowed him to achieve perfect evolution yet, but if that information could lead him to the perfect mutant, he could afford to take the risk. After all, he didn't have much time left. He then went to meet Detective Yu and apologized for keeping her waiting, hoping his appearance didn't frighten her. She reassured him it didn't and asked if what he had to tell the military would be of interest to her. He excused himself and unbuttoned his shirt to reveal the changes in his body, explaining he was in a state that would normally be impossible to survive. The additional bone spurs continued to grow as his body developed, and if his heart were pierced, that would be the end for him. Time was running out, and in exchange, he expected her full assistance in finding that person as soon as possible. She agreed, expressing pleasure in working with them. The scene shifted to Tien sitting on his farm, where he purchased 19 divine-level powerful seeds. He considered the level 4 divine-level powerful seed category, such as the cherry tomato. Its soil requirements included fertile, high-quality land with daily irrigation using pure water. The growth cycle spanned 18 days with a survival rate of 18%. Its effects included promoting genetic fission, enhancing beneficial genetic development, preventing negative genetic development, and promoting evolution. Tian explained that, in other words, the primary focus of Level 4 seeds was to promote evolution, which he saw as the key to a new era for mankind. He wondered if, in the future, humans could become gods. With such advancements, would he be the god who created the gods? He found the planting conditions to be harsh, realizing he needed to spend a lot of points to level up the land. Despite its expense, he proceeded with the purchase. He spent 95,000 points to purchase 19 good land upgrade coupons, leaving him with 5,000 housing and 680,000 points. Now, 19 ordinary lands had been upgraded to good land. He noted the nutrient-rich black soil capable of growing crops above level 4 and boosting yields for crops below level 3. Aware that there wasn't much time left before the second wave of the destruction season arrived, he considered growth agents, which were also costly. He purchased 12 growth agents, knowing their limited effectiveness in promoting the ripening of level 4 crops. 
He planned to add more agricultural robots to speed up planting and still needed to save points to buy ordinary seeds to upgrade his farm. All the small robots were busy farming, and Tian knew he had to do his best to harvest as many ripe crops as possible before the second wave of the destruction season arrived.